Well, I didn't get much chance this week to uh, do a whole lot. So this is not going to be a big, heavy session. It's going to be simpler. And uh, it's going to be much different than what we've done before, I guess, in some regards, in some ways very much the same. And it's a myth, it's the myth of Perseus. who represents sort of the uh, ultimate kind of hero. And we're going to do this in two sessions, basically so we can go slower and so that uh, we can cover a number of topics I want to cover. In fact, tonight we won't cover almost any heroism or initiation hardly at all. We'll just be going into some ideas, uh, background ideas. And we'll start with a genealogy, as we've done before. And uh, we're going to leave it on the board, so I'm going to put it on this side where it's more likely to last. This has to do with uh, the union of Poseidon and Libya. It's the same Libya as our country, Libya. And uh, I think Libya means rain condensation, dripping rain. And Poseidon means he who gives a drink of water from the wooded mountain. Poseidon is the uh, Roman Neptune. They united and they had a set of twins. And the names of these twins were... Adjinor and uh, Belus. And Belus married uh, a Chini, which the Greeks would probably have pronounced a Kinney. And they had a set of twins. and a third child. And this set of twins was Danus and Egyptus. Egyptus is where our word Egypt comes from. Uh, no, Egyptus means... Uh, Supply, supine he goat. Yes. Laying, reclining, usually laying back. And there was a third child that was not part of the twins, who was Cephas. So we, like it or not, we have gotten into. Uh, well, we'll put the whole the whole of this part of the chart up and the rest will come later. In fact, we're going to carry this on for weeks. After we finish this myth, we'll do some more fairy tales again for a little while. And then we'll go to, we'll carry on the lineage another generation and look at another kind of hero myth. And Danis had 50 daughters. And Egyptus had 50 sons. Yeah, it gets to be weird stuff. And we have enough right there to talk for hours and hours. We won't. The uh, This is an idea that we find in the Bible find in almost all mythology. This is a literal union of heaven and earth. That spirit and matter unite in that there is a fertility. The whole idea is that human beings form a pole or a link between the earth, which is very passive, but uh, virginly abundant 
that the earth gives forth, whereas spirit or heaven is tremendously active and driving, and that the union of the two of them brings forth all of the different creatures. Now, this is a very strange notion because uh, it deals with all of the versions of the union of heaven and earth, there is a, an association with the people, both with a divine source and with an earthly source. The teachers of the mysteries, since we are talking about a mystery outlook about mythology, with their clairvoyant vision, claim that there were humans before there was an earth and that the human evolution within the grand creation parallels and interacts with the creation of the cosmos so that human beings condensed into physical bodies in what is called the fall of humanity at about the same time that the earth was condensing into a, a solid ball inside of the solar cosmos. And there, there is a word that uh, describes this whole thing that the human beings were associated right with the earth, like they sprang right out of the earth and to uh, some extent are responsible for part of the earth because our creative activity with the mineral kingdom by taking the minerals into our bodies and with our consciousness transmuting their experience by giving them very live and, and sub, uh, supple forms changes them and helps them to evolve. And the word that describes, well, the word, one of the words, part of it is C-H-T-H-O-N-I-A-N, meaning of the underworld. And uh, when human beings, what? Phonian. This is all completely silent. Yeah. And beings that uh, spring out of the earth as the earth is created are called autophonian. And this is one of my favorite things for driving uh, uh, telephone operators uh, crazy. If I spell this word, over the telephone, it's C as in phonian, A as in aisle, M as in mnemonic, and P is in pneumatic. <laughs> it's, uh, it's enough to drive them crazy. So we're dealing then with different regions of the earth having different spiritual qualities. The minerals of the earth, the formation of the earth, and these different spiritual qualities are associated with different divinities. So it's sort of like saying that indigenous peoples or people living in a certain place, uh, it's like the Native Americans believed that the land owns them instead of them owning the land and that the land has a tremendous control over them. And uh, that's, what, that's the kind of thing that we're dealing with. Now, this, this goes much further than that because uh, this all took place in North Africa, this whole union. And, uh, oh, gee whiz, I should have gotten a globe or something out. The country that was the legacy of Poseidon and Libya is a little further east. And it is the country that was ruled by first by Belus and then by uh, as a heritage to as a uh, legacy to Danis and Egyptus. It is the country that we call Egyptus, which the Greeks called Oops, Chemis. It's 
Sometimes it was just shortened to Kim. And uh, this is where our word chemistry and alchemy come from. Uh, alchemy would be uh, the Arabic changing of this word to mean the science of Egypt because the all of the great magicians and manipulators of substance in the ancient world were the uh, Egyptians. Now, some of the mythography, which we're probably going to go into next year wholeheartedly, this is just sort of an introduction to the notion, some of that is very symbolic, but some of it is also very direct. The... Uh, the way it works is that Egypt was considered the center of the ancient world. Now, chemists also had another meaning in the ancient world, and it was a name for the Pleiades, or Pleiades, who are going to come up in this myth later on. We're going to have all kinds of, this is going to be a really intricate map of all kinds of beings of all different sorts uh, meshed together. And the Pleiades are in every part of the world and in every religion to all of the Native Americans, to all of the, even the Central and Southern American uh, uh, Incas and Aztecs to Africans, to all parts of the world, the Pleiades are the most recognized of all of the constellations. They are a little group of stars that sits on the shoulder of Taurus the bull. Uh, they're fairly near to the Hyades, and the Hyades, the Hesperides, and the Pleiades are groups of stars that are closely associated with each other. They're all feminine, but the Pleiades are considered sacred to, in all accounts. In some schools of occultism, the idea that there is a center to everything, to the entirety of all creation, you know, like there's a cent the sun is the center of our solar system, and in the direction of... Uh, of the uh, Milky Way in Sagittarius is the center of our galaxy. And then there are uh, balls of galaxies that have centers. But the center for the whole business is thought by many schools of occultism to be directly in the direction of the Pleiades. Now, this happens to be uh, a really tiny constellation. And... So sacred is this that uh, there is a direct divine correspondence between the heavens and the earth, such that if you place the Pleiades, which looks sort of like a little Y, there are actually more than nine in nine little stars in the constellation, though there are it's usually considered to be Alcyone and eight. Uh, other sisters are called sometimes called the seven brown sisters in fact uh, people who are born with uh, sun or moon or Neptune or something like that near the Pleiades often have either blindness or rare genius or both uh, because it's an area that is uh, a very potent area so it turns out by the latitudes that at some times in the uh, precessional cycle that the Pleiades fall exactly over the top of the Great Pyramid. And then you have a lining up of both chems. Chem meaning Egypt and the chem meaning the, uh, uh, the Pleiades. When that occurs on the north face of the Great Pyramid is uh, a descending passageway. And then partway down there is an ascending passageway 
okay, is called the Grand Gallery. And where these two join, there is a block in there. Such, and it turns out that if you fill this with water, and when you look down from the Grand Gallery and look up the reflection, this from any place in the Grand Gallery is one degree of space, both north and south and east and west. It perfectly fills one degree of space. And from the Grand Gallery, it points straight north. And when the Pleiades are straight overhead, then Thuban, uh, which is called uh, Alpha Draconis, sits right exactly in the middle of that only one spot, that one one opening. And that is when, when Thuban is the North Star in the precessional cycle. That's when the Pleiades are right straight overhead. And that's going to come up in all of this too. It's going to come up both in this myth and the uh, successor of this myth. Thuban, uh, Draconis is the dragon. And there is this great big serpentine dragon, the name of which we're going to pick up next week when we do the second half of this myth. And this serpentine dragon sleeps around the pole. And uh, this is sometimes called the blazing divine dragon of wisdom. It's sometimes seen as dragon, sometimes seen as serpent. The modern uh, renditions of it show it as a serpent, and the Atlantean renditions show it more like a huge big dinosaur or something like that. And so there is a connection then between Draco the dragon and the Pleiades on the uh, on the ecliptic. Now, if as above, so below, it turns out that if you put the Pleiades right over the Great Pyramid and Thuban at the North Pole, then different things happen. Uh, the uh, constellation of Taurus falls over the Taurus Mountains. Orion falls over Iran. Perseus uh, falls not too far from Persia. Uh, the uh, Cancer mother falls over Mother India. The Great Bear is over Russia, and the head of the dragon falls. Or the dragon's uh, the head of this this dragon uh, Draconis uh, falls over China, and uh, the uh, ancient name for the uh, for serpents was Can or K H A N, and the great serpent. Uh, uh, that Ophiuchus Vel serpents fights with, uh, that falls over Canada. And there's another thing with the, uh, the constellation of Scorpio used to look like a uh, diving eagle, and what is now the tail of the scorpion used to be with a serpent in its mouth. And the, the uh, eagle with the serpent in its mouth falls over Mexico. Remember they, when Mexico was founded, they were told to go to a place where you see a uh, uh, where you see an eagle with a serpent in its mouth? Remember the... the yes, that's a, it's still on their flag. It's a national symbol. That fits together with this whole thing. Now, is this the North Star we have now, or is this the North Star back in the This is the North Star uh, in... Uh, I forget exactly when it is, but this it is one of there's there's a whole circle, yeah, yeah. yeah. There is the the uh, Alpha Draconis circles around the pole of the ecliptic. I mean the the Draconis the, the serpent goes all the way around the pole of the ecliptic, and on its head is one of the feet of Heracles. He's sort of kneeling like that, and this is one foot, and this is the other foot, and he's standing here, and he's got a hand. In one hand, he's got uh, a bunch of serpents, and then his head is here, and then overhead, he's got a club, and one of the feet stands on the head of the dragon. And around around this pole of the ecliptic is a circle of stars, 
one of which is our current North Star, which is uh, Polaris, which is, there's a, there are a whole bunch of myths about that as well. And one of those is in the body of the serpent, and it's the brightest star in the body of the serpent, so it's called Alpha. Alpha. They go Alpha, Beta by the brightness of the stars. In fact, nowadays it isn't even the brightest anymore. It used to be, but it is no longer. And so when, as the pole, Earth wobbles on its axis and changes pole stars, when the pole star is in the dragon, right at Alpha Draconis, that's when it comes right down the, uh, the pipe of this. Okay. Now, all of this says then that there is a relationship in a way, uh, a direct re mapping like relationship between the heavens and the earth, as above, so below. Now, we all know that Poseidon or Neptune rules uh, Pisces, Pisces. And in this setup that we have here, if we had look at North Africa, Egypt would be uh, the uh, central, would be the eastern part of North Africa, and that would be Taurus. The central or the east central part, part of North Africa would be Aries. The west central part of Africa would be Pisces, which is ruled by Poseidon. And so this myth, as strange as it may seem, there is a union between Poseidon in heaven and, and Libya on earth, because everything was considered, everything in, from the desert west of Egypt was all considered Libya. All right. Uh, <laughs> we have, I don't want to run too long here. Okay, and now we come again to, uh, this is going to be a lot of scattered ideas tonight. Uh, we come to uh, a uh, theme that is a very common theme in mythology. Uh, in the uh, biblical myths, we have Abel and Cain fighting. Or we have uh, Jacob and uh, we have... Uh, Jacob and Esau, and Ishmael and Isaac. And then in the Greeks, we have the uh, uh, Castor and uh, Polydeuces. These are also fighting brothers. Agenor and Belus don't get along well with each other. And this is a very common, uh, a very common myth. And this is a myth that the brothers struggle always from birth. And in many cases, they struggle in the womb. And this struggle is a, has to do with the nature of polarity. The brothers represent two different poles. It's a psychological fact that if you have children, that those children have to be different from each other in order to develop their own individualities without being too much like each other. You know, like a, a first child, if a first child is hardworking, a second child might be more of a goof-off. Because, or if the one, one is very scientific, the next might be very artistic because the younger one by development, can't possibly keep up with the older one, so it has to do something different. This is a case of the fighting is necessary because any time there is a manifestation, a creative statement, there is an expression of energy. And in this expression of energy or in this creative activity, there is a differentiation between what is and what is not. And that automatically produces a polarization. And this polarization is found right within the energy. It's the, it's the same kind of polarization as between heaven and earth or between active and passive. And the legacy, in fact, 
is the energy that is expended through these twin forces. And so when you have fighting brothers, because like in the, it gets resolved in the case of the Discori, uh, Castor and Polydeuces, because they love each other so much that they share immortality. Because one of them was uh, one of them was uh, immortal and one wasn't. But they loved each other so much that they shared immortality. So that when one was on, the other was off. And so polarity is the fact between. Once there is a manifestation of being, there's a differentiation between being and non-being. And once you have that whole differentiation, you have the differentiation between what I know and what I don't know. And in the interaction between those opposite poles is where all creation begins. It's like saying that God is a unity. But if that unity were to stay in a um, homostatic state where God just was as one, nothing would be accomplished. But it is when there is an internal differentiation that in that di- internal differentiation that things are come about, usually because there's inequality. Uh, it's nice to think in terms of complete democracy, but no- nothing gets uh, where everybody is absolutely equal to everybody else, but nothing gets done that way. It's in the struggle going back and forth from one kind of inequality to another kind of inequality that something gets done. This is what is the second law of thermodynamics. Nothing gets accomplished except energy goes from a higher state to a lower state. And there's always an attraction between opposite poles, and there's always a struggling between opposite poles. So we have a necessary inequality. Now, these polarizations are passed on. I don't know how to say that, that one kind of polarity produces another kind of polarity, produces another kind of polarity, that the poles usually get reversed, such that uh, on one plane uh, there's a tendency, you know, like the... the, uh, physical or the dense plane in which we spend most of our attention, uh, that tends to be itself in its nature very negative and receptive. Then comes a much more uh, active plane and then, you know, there are alternations and balances just as there are in the zodiac. We want to look mostly at this second set of twins, Danis and Egyptus, because it was clear that in the first set that Belus uh, was born first of the two and claimed his birthright, and he was to pass it on between his firstborn, which were Danus and Egyptus, and they didn't know which was which, and there was a constant struggle over who was to get the inheritance. Uh, Cephas or Cephas will come up later on. We'll talk about that next week because it weaves back into the myth later on. Kephas was the, uh, uh, you might say that this turns out to be Greece, southern Greece. This is Egypt. And this is Ethiopia. And here we have Libya. All right. Now this is <laughs> this is a really strange kind of it's it's something that I don't know the full meaning of it so I'll just give you the general meaning. There are many things in this that I don't understand. When Belus passed on the war broke out between Danus and Egyptus and the were constantly fighting with each other and they must have been doing something more than fighting because they had uh, a large number of progeny. But the uh, way that works out is the 50 daughters and 50 sons represent each half cycles of lunations. 
there is a cycle, and strangely enough, it's the same cycle that is uh, shown in Stonehenge. You know that beside the great big stone figures that make for Stonehenge, out at a distance around the outside of Stonehenge are sunk into the ground 50 stones. And it's only been in the last uh, 10 or 20 years that they have noted that those stones are related with positionings of either new moons or of eclipses. There are so many cycles of sun and moon that there is an eclipse cycle that is 50 uh, eclipses or 50 new moons long. And the lunar half, obviously, it, uh, repre is represented by the daughters, and the solar half is represented by the sons. And what is indicated here, see what happens is Egyptus says, why don't my 50 sons marry your 50 daughters and then our inheritance will be united. Uh, they didn't worry too much about uh, too close of inbreeding in those days. They weren't at all concerned about that. And that gives you the whole idea right there that uh, the union of the sun and the moon has to do with uh, a new moon or, or an eclipse. But Danis is suspicious. He doesn't trust Egyptus. And so he sends off to the oracle, and the oracle says, you're right. He does want to take over your, your whole inheritance. And uh, so he flees. It's an interesting thing that uh, it's hard telling, you know, before you have a clear insight into things, and you're a very personal individual before you have, uh, before you develop a strong individuality and you can unite with divinity and become objectively strong in yourself, you're very, very subjective. And in those cases, the intuition is associated with suspicion, which is a very tricky matter because suspicion very uh, sometimes is associated with desires. And we're going to see that that, that, that turns out that in the early stages of our development, our suspicions are wrapped around intuitions sometimes, and sometimes they're wrapped around base desires, and it's hard to tell which is which and when is when. But in this case, uh, Danis is correct in following his intuition manifest as uh, suspicions, and he sees his brother means him no good, and in terms of the way things were settled, obviously uh, 50 sons are more of an asset if there's a struggle than 50 daughters. So he takes the course of uh, flight. And he builds the first two-prow ship and takes his 50 daughters and flees. The two-prow ship has something to do with there, you know, there is a, uh, hmm, how to say this? I don't know if I can even bring the idea across. Numbers in alternation find fulfillment of what they set out to do in the numbers in between them. One is a unity. And one, when it asserts itself in unity, asserts itself, as we just said, through two, which is the pole. And that becomes the vehicle, but it becomes completed in the number three, which is triangulation, which has the eternal type of quality that and stability that one has, but it has the active quality or the vehicle of two. And so then two is a propellant, but it's not a fulfilled propellant until it comes to three. There's a more, much more stability in a tricycle than there is in a bicycle. And there is a completion in, in that uh, all the dimensions or all the directions are covered in three where they aren't all covered in two. And so the 
notion, you know, that the ancient Greeks had where they made a big deal about this is the first two-prowled ship, and the two-prowled ship is, was much more stable and less likely to tip over and allowed them to, f- to flee in luxury. They stop in various places along the way. They stop in uh, Rhodes and a few other places, and they found cities and do things like that. The Greeks were always fond of uh, that kind of thing. They were always trying to master other people. And they eventually come to the Peloponnese and to the edge of Greece proper. And when they get there, they come to an area called uh, oops, Lerna in Argos. And this is where the Argive nation is found. Now this Lernia is going to come back to us in weeks again later on. But uh, we'll we'll leave that sit for right now. But when they get there, uh, Danis, though he may be uh, frightened of his brother Egyptus, tells Galanor, who is the uh, oh, who is the uh, current king of. Uh, Argos, he tells him, I'm the new order of the day. I am divinely decreed to take over your kingdom. This is it. This is me. God has sent me. And uh, Galanor is not too happy about this, and he gets set to do battle. But what happens is that there is a dream and an event that in the night, Wolves come down from the mountains and they eat up the herds of Galanor's cattle and especially they take the lead cow and eat the lead cow. Having this dream and having this event reported, Galanor says, hmm, he does have divine dispensation. (laughs) And says, this is the hand of God and that's the last we hear of Galanor. <laughs> and uh, Danis takes over. Now, it uh, he builds, the first thing he does is builds in the temple, a temple to wolfish Apollo, since Apollo is the uh, lord of kings, and this is the uh, ravenous, wolfish, everything. The sun eats up everything. Given uh, a condition of all sun and no moon, that he is all fire and no water, you have a desert. And uh, so this this was a temple to uh, wolfish Apollo. Uh, and one of the first things Danis does, and this is the significance of this, is through his daughters, he starts the... the Thesmorphic Mysteries. Now you remember last week when we, uh, last year when we spent all of those times talking about the uh, uh, Greek mysteries of uh, of Demeter and Persephone. The Thesmorphic Mysteries are the mysteries of Demeter Ceres. So, this whole transference of this cycle, we could have followed this right down into the, into the mysteries as they were celebrated in Greece. The whole myth does travel that way, and we'll touch on that a little bit in a few weeks. But the whole idea is here that uh, the, there is, in this cycle of 50 lunations or eclipses, there is a transference of the mysteries. You know, like whenever you go through a major cycle, we're coming to, to through a major change of cycle right now, a very major change of cycle that involves a, a large number of planets, and uh, 
it's putting uh, all of the major outer planets in first phase to each other, and we're having huge, big changes in society. Things that were unbelievable 10 years ago or even five years ago have happened, and they've changed so quickly that even the CIA didn't know anything about it. Uh, that, But this cycles like that. There is... A cycle is like a race. It's not just a circle. It's not just something that is repeated endlessly. It's like every year there is a given work that has to be accomplished. And the given work that is in this cycle is to take the mysteries of Isis and bring them in the form of the mysteries of Demeter, later as Roman Ceres, as the thesmorphic mysteries in Greece. Because the age of the Greek society is now that it's old enough for this kind of a culture meant. And so this is a cycle that represents the work being accomplished is a change from one society to another. Okay. It turns out, though, uh, that these, the mysteries of Demeter and Isis, these are both feminine uh, divinities, and they have to do with the re- more receptive side of things, and that means relative to fire and water, that means water. And it turns out in this area of Lernia, there is no water. And uh, they're having a hard time to survive. And (laughs) so what happens is Danis sends his daughters out to start searching for water. And as as they are out, well, I don't even know how to... Amimon... His daughter, Amimon, is out in the woods searching for a stream or something like that. And as she's out there, a satyr assaults her, grabs her, and is about to uh, rape her when uh, Poseidon comes along and sees her in distress. And... uh, Seeing her in distress, he takes and he throws his trident and he's, the satyr dodges and the uh, trident sticks right into the side of the rock and uh, but the satyr is chased off and Poseidon comes up and like a gentleman, he decides to rape her instead. <laughs> oh. That happens, you know. That happened right here in town. A woman was saved from a rape by a man who turned around and raped her himself. Yeah, it happened right here in the city. Uh, We could talk about that, but it's too far-fetched to talk about. Uh, I I, I don't want to, to, to say too much about it. But what happens is uh, she does. He doesn't really rape her, but uh, they have they love each other and they sleep together. And Poseidon claims his uh, trident, and when he pulls out his trident out of the three spots in the rock where the uh, tines had stuck in the rock, three streams spring out, and those streams never uh, go dry. And they never go dry uh, and they're faithful all the time. In fact, there's so much water that they develop a lake, which is called Lake Lernia. And this is this will come up later on because this is where the Lernian Hydra, you're familiar with the story of Heracles and the uh, Lernian Hydra, It's one of the twelve labors of Heracles. We'll talk about that later on. Uh, We're going to leave after after these two talks. We're going to leave Greek mythology for quite a while. 
I think. Maybe we'll come back to it quickly. I don't know. I'm working it all off. But at any rate, this represents, I don't know how to say this. This represents that there's a common theme within a whole mythos. Within this whole generation, following generation, there is a common theme. And what we have here, which is Poseidon, who represents the Lord of the Mysteries. Mercury and Neptune are the two planets that have to do with the spiritual mysteries. Mercury has to do with the in intelligent use of the uh, creative force uh, that is called mystery wisdom. Poseidon deals with the spiritual stuff and the spiritual nature that is involved in initiation. And what we're talking about here, when we're bringing forth water out of the rock, whether it is as Moses did it by beating it, or as uh, Poseidon did by putting his fork into it, his, uh, his trident, we're talking here about bringing out new life in a barren way, and we're again talking about the uh, union of heaven and earth, which is what initiation is all about. Initiation is the fulfillment or the culmination of the whole creation itself. Uh, the series of initiations are not just acts of destiny, and they're not just small... Uh, relivings of all of the archetypal works and events that take place in our evolution, but involved in each of them is an activity of spiritual creation. And so what we're talking about is a creative, living kind of water that is reproduced. All right, we're still in the, this is still all introduction. We haven't gotten to the story we want to get to. And we're You can never run away from your problems. And a good part of uh, spiritual development and a good part of heroism or heroinism is not running, but standing and confronting things face to face. Because what your problems are, are you. And if you run, you set up a situation where, you think, where things are going to chase you, things of your own creation. And this is exactly what happens to Danis and daughters. Egyptus, even though he has Egypt all to himself now, in name he still doesn't have the birthright totally to himself. So what Egyptus does is he sends his 50 sons after Danis and his 50 daughters. And uh, the sons come and they approach Danis and they say, uh, we uh, want to make the same proposal again. The 50 of us will marry your 50 daughters. Only Danis is now a king in his own right and he's got, he's got his own power here and he says, no. And it isn't going to come about. So what happens then is Egyptus' sons, they've been told not to come back unless they have accomplished their goal. So what they do is they lay siege to uh, Danis' settlement and they have them surrounded. And because the streams of water at Lernia don't run through the city, they don't have water again. And they're starving for water and they're dying of thirst. And eventually Dana sees the light and he says, all right, my 50 daughters will marry you 50 boys. And so they set up this big grand marriage feast. And uh, what he does is he gives each of his 50 daughters 
a very sharp, thin pin. And uh, he says, when you go to bed tonight with your new husbands, in the night, pierce them through the skull and kill them. And so there are there's a grand wedding ceremony. <laughs> uh, the uh, there's a, a grand wedding ceremony, and the fifty sons married the fifty daughters, and they all uh, have their wedding night with them, and they are all killed in the night but one, and. Hypimestra is the daughter. We have to put her in line now because uh, she spares her husband. I don't know what's his name. I've got it written here. Lincius or Lincius. She spares her husband, the reason being that uh, he spares her virginity. And eventually she falls in love with him. And she not only spares him his life, but uh, helps him get away. And she helps him get away by us, uh, lighting beacon lights. And uh, so this is <laughs> it's a very complex story. Uh, you might say that the uh, end of one cycle always begins, begets the beginning of the next cycle. And you might say then that the youngest of the 50 daughters, the last one in line, starts off a whole new cycle. In turn, Lincius actually goes back and kills Danius. When he, when he returns later on, he kills Danius. And that's like, that's true to form anyway. Because what, ha what is established in the new cycle or in a new form has to wipe out everything that came before. Because this is a revolution. All cycles or all circles where you're going through new things, uh, it's new and you can't, you don't want, you don't put new wine in old bottles. And the revolutionary change is necessary so that the experience is fresh and you're not held back. Look at the look at the society that passed most things on from ancient to modern times, and you have one of the slowest and most hidebound societies of all, China. China always kept the old ways and never had revolutionary even even the, the Mao's revolution, the original revolution in forty nine and the cultural revolution were not enough to change them from being bound by the old ways. And the country still has difficulties with a revolutionary modernization. And I don't think it's just because of the size of the country. It's because of the ingrainedness of the attitudes and the unwillingness to accept new things. And so we have a cyclical changeover where the old cycle is turned over to a new cycle the uh, piercing with the pins probably has something to do, uh, it, it has an astronomical meaning with the uh, uh, syzygy effect of, uh, oh, I forget what, the, there's a word that uh, describes when there is an exact conjunction of sun and moon yeah, in, a, in a great place. There's a, a, a precise focusing, but it also probably has to do, if this has to do with the mysteries, uh, Symbolically, in some cases, even physically, uh, at the point of the skull, Golgotha, where all of the bones come together, and this is the area through which it is mythically said that one leaves the body. If you're in the etheric body, it doesn't make any difference. You just go right straight up and out anyway, and you pass right through things. But there used to be, symbolically, in some cases, even physically, uh, in, like in places like China, that they, there was even one of the one of the men who was a student of mystery in China actually had a hole cut in the top of his head, and he, for his entire life he stuck a candle in it and burned a candle and had the light over the top of his head, like the uh, light that stood over the uh, apostles at the uh, Pentecost. 
uh, or that anyone sees with clairvoyance, you see a light about this far over the top of the head, it's very bright. This has to do with, uh, it, it points to the custom of a skull trepanning or trepanning. And it's an opening up or making a passageway to climb to the uh, Mount Golgotha and to seek that kind of freedom. And it has something to do with that in the mysteries, but that's a, a very vague thing. Tonight we have only vague things. We don't have anything really concrete and heavy and distinct. So at any rate, uh, the two are married, and they're married happily. And those beacons, uh, this is something that is also taken from uh, Egypt. Uh, that uh, Egypt was the center of the world in another way. Egypt was the astronomical center of the world because the Great Pyramid was the most precise observatory for observing uh, astronomical phenomena and all of the dimensions of the solar system were built right into it. And it was used together with obelisks to determine exactly the times of the solstices and equinoxes. Like a lot of the temples in Egypt were set up such that at solstices and only on solstices did the sunlight come right down through the columns and uh, uh, right into the Holy of Holies. And it's such that by procession of the equinox, in some cases, they had to move huge, big pillars like that. They moved them two or three times to keep up with the procession of the equinoxes. But in the ancient world, at the moment when it was precisely the moment of winter solstice, they lit fires. And there were fires that were prepared all over uh all over the world, and they were beacon fires, so that at that precise moment, a fire was lit, and then somebody seeing another fire lit another one, and it's sort of like the whole of Europe lit up at that time, and so like we're again at something that indicates, you know, winter solstice coming up is the time, the most likely time that anyone can attain to discipleship or initiation or have that ability to see into the earth or leave the body or something like that. And the beacon fires of the new light in darkness, because part of the Egyptian mysteries had to do with being able to, do, to generate your own light and not to depend on an outer light outside of yourself. And the uh, beacon lights are, uh, go back to that kind of a, of a, of a custom. Uh, so later on, they're reunited and, uh, uh, they, uh, uh, like, like Lintius or Lintius comes back to Egypt, uh, comes back to Greece, and so does Egyptus come to Greece, but he doesn't take over as king. He dies in the temple of Serapis, which indicates that it was a thorough transplanting. And the temple of Serapis was the, was an identical uh, temple as much as they could make it with Greek styles to the temple of Serapis in Egypt, in, which was in Memphis in Egypt. And Serapis was the common symbol. This was obviously in the age of Taurus, and Serapis was the symbol. Then it was the statue of the great uh, sun king as bull with its horns having the sun shield in it. And it had to do with the procession to equinox in the period of the times. So it ties together that kind of cycle. We still haven't gotten to the story yet. We'll, we'll get there. We'll, we'll tell most of the story next time. All right, now we're set to carry on our... Uh, we don't know here whether this, this is the... Uh, this is the daughter or not, but somewhere, because uh, all of these 50 daughters uh, took on other husbands afterwards, according to the story. But from one of the daughters, we don't know which, so let's just take the names out of here and just put a question mark in, but it seems likely that this is the one that we were talking about. The history doesn't record this. But uh, Abbas which means lizard. And he married uh, Aglia. And from their union 
came another set of twins. And there are Proteus and Chrysus. And they are another set of fighting twins. And they were bickering over the inheritance again. It's sort of the same energy that's being passed back and forth, you know, because that's that's what the inheritance is. Uh, it, it's get transduced from plane to plane to plane, and they're still fighting over it. And uh, an unusual thing happens here. Uh, they have the whole kingdom now, but the whole kingdom has shifted from Egypt to Greece, and it's all within this one family. Now, uh, they divide the kingdom up when Abbas dies. Abbas is considered a very, very fierce, fierce warrior, but they divide the kingdom up, and Acrisus gets uh, the capital uh, of Lernia and the island area and the sea coast and such goes to Proteus. And Proteus takes a, a bunch of cyclops with him and builds a, a city that's made all out of rocks and things like that. Seven cyclops he takes with him. And Acrisus is having a difficulty because he wants to have a family. He wants to have heirs, so to perpetuate his side of the uh, his side of the inheritance, and he can't have a child, and he can't have a child, and so he appeals to the oracle, and the oracle tells him, "Acrisus, you will have no sons, and your grandson will kill you." And so he has a daughter, and his daughter's name is Danny. Now, there's so much jealousy going on here that what happens is, um, oh boy, I don't know. What happens is there are questions about Danny. One of the things that happens is Proteus has hanky pank with her, not only out of uh, desire, but he wants to make sure that she has a son, because he wants Acrisis to die. But uh, Acrisis wants to make sure that she doesn't have any children. He tries to protect him. Self from from this possibility. So what he does is he makes a brass tower, a dungeon-like tower that's shaped something like this. And in here is where Danny is forced to live. The only opening is a hole in the top. <laughs> it's, it's a strange story, but just to let the, you know. I, I, I get amazed by the, by the stories because all the way through here we have all of these twins that fight with each other. Poseidon keeps coming back into the action again and again. You have all of these holes at the top. Do you know what I, what I mean? And the, the themes, it, it's like they bludgeon you with, uh, with themes over again and again. Now it turns out that Danny is very very beautiful. And her beauty is renowned so that Zeus, my goodness, did you see that? <laughs> that bee ran into the light and dripped on you. <laughs> no, it wasn't raining or raining here, I don't think. Is that from the bee? I saw the bee once. Uh -huh. If, if, if it's from the ceiling, we're in big trouble, but I don't believe that. But Zeus, or Zeus, as the, some of the Europeans say, 
uh, hears of Danny and he has to see for himself. And he comes into the tower as a golden mist. And he unites with Danny and our hero is born. Obviously, the materialistic cynics would say that Perseus is the result of hanky-pank with Proteus, and the spiritual folks would say that it's the result of the divine union with Zeus. Now, this is a theme and an idea that is very common in all societies and in all cases where there are heroes. There is always a questionable source of their heritage, where they came from. And there is also a divine parentage. So there's a divine parentage and an earthly parentage. And this is a myth that I have followed quite a great deal in uh, its sociological aspect because I have a lot of women friends who are single parents. And what we have here is the myth of the invisible father. And this does a number of things that all of the heroes almost become heroes because they don't see their father. Now, in terms of the uh, Trinity, or in terms of spirituality, if we have something like we had last, last year, if we had Osiris, Isis, and Horus, the avenging hero. In this case, it's Perseus, who is the Avenger, I believe Perseus means uh, destroyer. Perseus means destroyer. It indicates that uh, this impetuous quality, remember when we talked about Susan Owl a few weeks ago, the impetuous male, and this constant seeking for the roots. Remember Susan Owl wanted to go into the underworld. And, uh, and see, really see his mother or see his parentage. There is something that I have followed because I've had a number of friends that were my age that the father was missing. And what this did and what I saw in the horoscope is with the notion of an invisible father, there was a feeling of incompleteness. There was a feeling of... Uh, I need to find something out about myself. And this is the kind of thing that leads to the quest for ultimately the most stable or the most secure, the eternal kind of father. Moreover, there is the great, influ the much greater influence of the mother. And there isn't this matter of being constantly overshadowed by the father. And there is a gentilification that takes place with this stronger feminine influence. So the, this is sort of like the nuclear family with one of the parents being invisible. And that's the way it always is. That the highest attribute of the Trinity, such as like the Gnostics did it, when they had the triangle of the Trinity, they always had the top open and with fire because it was invisible because there was no way that they could ever objectify it or talk about it or say that this is the uh, nature of, you know, no man hath seen the Father. Uh, seers like Heindel, for example, claim that all you, you, you know, it's impenetrable. Nobody can see into that realm. This is the invisible power that is the truth that one senses or that one feels, but that there is no objectification in words that uh, that tells about it and says that this is uh, that this is the way things are. So at any rate, we have then the myth of uh, of somebody growing up in, in this is 
if you recognize it, uh, there's one famous tower like this left in the world. There are many others that are there. Uh, this is the uh, uh, the Tower of Pisa is a tower just like this. They used to have staircases. The uh, even the uh, uh, Essenes had towers like this, where they had staircases. Spiral staircases on the inside of the tower going in. And that once you had access to the tower, you would come down on the inside, and the, the spirals were such that you always were turning to the right when you came out, uh, and when you were going in, you were always turning to the left. And these are astronomical towers. They're sort of for locating like the north star of where you live. This is like an orientation thing. It is a true thing that if you get into a deep enough well that you can look out and with no light coming from the side, you can see stars in the daytime. And there is a star that is called, now you can't say it for every place, but there is a latitude star. And that star has more influence over any given area of the Earth than any other star because that star is coming directly overhead and is, is etching straight down its own energy and giving its quality to every part of the, to everyone in that part of the Earth day by day by day. And you can tell if you're, you know, if you didn't have clocks, and you had to do everything by the stars, uh, and the sun is unreliable because the days are longer and shorter, and you want an orientation to the star of your latitude, you want to be able to see it. So you make these big, tall towers, and you lay on your back looking up, and uh, you can see, you can actually get so that you can recognize the latitude star during the daytime. There's, there's much more to it than all of that. Uh, but uh, we'll talk about some little things because this is, turns out to be a very astronomical myth. In fact, when we get to the end of this, we're going to talk about the astronomical nature of it. Uh, this is a bronze tower, and this is saying and bronze is the uh, metal that is a consequence of our sin. It's a mixture between uh, uh, copper and zinc, isn't it? I believe it is. It's an artificial metal, one that isn't found naturally, and our brazen nature is like that. It's an unnatural state, and it's only because that we have fallen into the world where we can't any longer, into the material world so deeply that we can't any longer look with the spiritual vision and get the truth and guidance that we have to orient ourselves to stars and have things like astrology as a symbolic uh, framework and we can't see the reality of the spiritual world straightforward. So there's something like that going on here. These, these towers also had uh, great spiritual purposes because they were obviously secret for doing initiations and the whole idea of Jacob's ladder going up, spiraling up higher and higher each time all of the spirals of evolution. This was probably this kind of tower was also a temple of, uh, of initiation. The golden uh, mist of Zeus was probably had something to do with the development of the soul nature and out of the uh, out of the pure, beautiful virgin personality and a golden soul nature is where the hero is born out of. Okay. Acrisis is, you know, in the same way that Danis couldn't run away from his problems. Acrisis couldn't put armor around his potential problems. And so he's, now he's got a grandson and a grandson that he has been told is going to kill him. And because he is a king, he can't just go out. To, you know, if you're a king, you're, you're supposed to be the judge and the protector of the law and of morality. He can't just... Uh, 
kill his uh, grandson or his daughter for that matter. And so he has to do something. And here again we come to another symbol that we've been looking at all the way going back to uh, Isis and Osiris. And it's a common one, especially in Egypt. He puts... He puts the... He seals the two of them in a casket. Just like the caskets we were talking about last week, or the last time we met. And he puts them out to sea. And he leads them to their fate. The casket, as again as we saw, is when we looked at Isis and Osiris, that the dimensions, remember that the casket that was made for Osiris when uh, Typhon, his brother, trapped him, they were made exactly to his proportions. And that's how uh, Typhon got him to, uh, to enter into the casket in the first place. He said, I have this magnificent casket here. Whoever fits into it perfectly can have it. And he had all of his men ready to seal it shut, you know, clasp upon clasp. And so what he did is he put the casket out there and all of the different gods in ascending order of dignity got in and it didn't fit any of them. And then uh, uh, Osiris fit in and he fit perfectly. And immediately they put the lid down and they sealed it all shut and they put it down the river, and when they got it down the river, they opened it up and uh, cut them into pieces. Uh, if you remember that story, here we have a mother and son put into a casket. Now, last time we talked about the caskets a little bit, but we didn't uh, look into it really deeply. I, I don't want to look into it deeply this time. I just want to give you a few little ideas about it. The casket... If you remember, Osiris represents the spirit of the father manifest in matter. And this is the process of squaring the circle. And in the same way that the circle represents spirit, in that it's perfect and it's endless, it's beginning and end are, are the same, and it goes on forever and ever, which is why the wearing of the ring represents the manifestation of spirit in such a way that it is singularized. The squaring of the circle represents the materialization or the objectification of matter. Now, this... The squaring of the circle is, we said before, that one through the process of two, which divided and polarized, found a complete manifestation. So there was an inside and an outside uh, within the number three. Well, the number two, which does the division and does the testing and trying by having the opposition, it gets fulfilled in the number four, which is the square. The square is the way we can't measure a triangle, we can't measure a circle, we can't measure anything else except by breaking it up into the number of little squares. What is the uh, one-half base times the height? is the number of squares that are in, the, in that are in a triangle. And so the square then is a fulfillment of the polarized testing in that it goes it's a pole against the pole and it represents within a plane of consciousness it represents the ultimate in objectivity, the ultimate in in testing. Now, if you take the first completion and put it together with the uh, objectification and the test and the trial, we see whether it is square. Uh, we can't build anything, you know, not even uh, an arch unless we build it on the square. 
because without the, the principle of the square, the force of gravity is going to draw on things and anything is going to fall apart. So if we take and put together three squares, uh, then we have the completion of spirit in objectification and we have the testing of of the spirit in the three-dimensional world, where we can have, in a three-dimensional sense, an outside and an inside. And so in the marriage of three and four, we have the completion of spirit and matter put together. And that's exactly what this is. There are six planes in, in a casket, but basically there are six faces in a cas casket, but they're all square sides, and they're all three dimensions, up, down, right, left, forward, back. And in that, the, the casket then represents the union of threefold completion, where you can look neutrally from all three points of view, and it represents the objective testing of matter and the final completion in terms of externalization. This can be seen in another way, such that if we take the Cartesian axis, and we look, if we put our center of vision such that we're looking not in either of the dimensions, but looking at them all equally, and carry them all out to infinity from someone looking out this way or looking across the casket, this would be the points that are described by the three dimensions this way, this way, and this way. If we were looking out so that we can focus on all three of them at the same time, they indeed become an equilateral triangle. And then the human perspective represents the tetrahedral point in that triangle. And that tetrahedron is what, uh, you know, the, each of the foci of the tetrahedron relates to the completed work of the cosmos. If one of these relates to the Father as the highest initiate, another relates to the Son as another highest initiate, and another one relates to the Holy Spirit as another one, the human point that comes to the objectification of all of these three together and ties it into the material world, we'll just call it Jesus for the, uh, for the use of the words, that is what is represented in the casket and that is what is represented in the tetrahedral form that is a simple statement of the casket. It's like saying that we're completed. It's like saying... In the uh, great sea, that is space. God has cast God's bread upon the water in the form of a casket. And that casket has come to fruition in its final state of materialization. And that final state of materialization is in humanity. And we sort of represent the cosmos as a turning point where things are not going to get any more material than this, and we reach our waking consciousness as being, again, the pole between heaven and earth, when we see the pole between heaven and earth here as an objectified state of consciousness. And it is our duty that in the same way that we measure things in the material world scientifically, artistically, things like that. The objective consciousness that we have here, where we see only the outside in the same way that Perseus and Danny only saw the inside, that it is our duty to do that kind of objective, uh, objective realization of the external of things because our understanding as it comes from that is fed to the gods so that we see the outside because the gods don't have the eyes to see here. And so our work as human beings, we are heroes if we objectively look at things and say things are that way. That is our work that we do. And this is what it means 
to say we're sort of isolated, all of us, each, each one of us being a hero, and each one of us giving birth to the cosmos in ourselves, because each of us is a microcosm of the cosmos, that when we're cast off on our own and put in our, our own little caskets, like we talked about the Platonists calling the physical body the scarcophagus, uh, because the spirit is buried in the underworld, which is the material world that we live in, that each of us, that we, when we are, are in our caskets or in our coffins, that each of us is redeeming and regenerating and rising from the death by actually dissolving and uh, doing the work of building and dwelling inside of our caskets. So something like that is, <laughs> none of that's in the notes, but that's... Uh, uh, we got to have something where we uh, where we talk about something a little bit serious. But at any rate, uh, uh, much as you leave things up to chance, or think you're leaving up things up to chance, destiny always is certain. And so the casket that contains Danny and Perseus uh, comes up on the island or on the shore of Seriphos, I believe it is. Yes, Seriphos. And an old fisherman, which we won't go into the fisher king or Peter as a fisher or all of those things, we'll pass on all of those, is the, the man, <laughs> or Oanis or all of those, we have a, you know, you get into myths, they just compound on each other. Uh, an old fisherman named Dictes finds the casket and finds both of them in there, and they're both in good shape. And uh, Dictes happens to be brother to the king called Polydectes. And so he presents them to Polydectes, and uh, Polydectes is uh, uh, enamored of Danny because she's so beautiful, and is a little wary of the young boy uh, Perseus because he's he seems uh, a threat even as a boy, and so Perseus is raised up under something like a stepfather. All the times we've looked previously at, at, at heroines, we've looked at stepmothers. But in this case, we have a stepfather. And the stepmothers were always pretty direct. They were pretty open about their malice. The Polydectes acted like he liked Perseus. But he worked very indirectly and very sneakily. You know, that's very, you know, inside we are very different than we are outside. And it takes a very developed kind of person so that the outer personality and the inner individuality are completely well-rounded and thoroughgoing in their development so that a person can be the same inwardly as they are outwardly. Uh, if that isn't the case, and they are this, if, if, if someone is the same inwardly as they are outwardly, and they're not well developed, you have a very shallow individual. But if you have a rounded out individual where all the facets of character are developed, and the inside is like the outside, you have a highly developed person. You know, but in the same way, sitting in this tower, because we're so much in the material world, we have to have symbols in order to like astronomy or astrology to look into the inner worlds or like mythology to look into the inner worlds because we can't yet perceive those directly. Part of the symbol of what we are outwardly, what we are inwardly and not that it doesn't show outwardly is in our parents, in, in our partners. Who, you know, like what when we say, if you don't want to know what a man is really like, look at his wife. Because that indicates part, the part of the individuality that is most ripe for development, for bringing out from inside. And uh, so there is that kind of union. We won't, we won't go much into that. But at any rate, they grow up with this kind of triangle. Danny 
is very beautiful and very attached to Perseus. Yeah. And Polydectes loves Danny. Perseus loves Danny. And these two are sort of wary of each other. And they're constantly fighting. Danny, sort of like Penelope in the story of Odysseus, Danny manages to keep Polydectes away so that there really isn't a marriage and so that they're growing up in his court. He's sort of like a pseudo stepfather. And Perseus is uh, sort of like an innocent young man, but he's a really sincere young man. And what Polydectes understanding the nature of youth and understanding the sincerity of Perseus, he acts in a sneaky way to be the downfall of Perseus. He sets up this false marriage. He really wants to marry Danny, but he sets up this uh, uh, false marriage, and he's going to marry this woman and all of his... uh, Lords and courtiers are around just saying that they're going to give him this gift and that gift. And Perseus is standing around there. And uh, one, of the, one of the lords, on the, uh, had, this was all set up by Polydectes, he said, uh, and what are you giving for a wedding gift to Polydectes? And Perseus says, I don't have anything to give. But he said, if I did uh, have something to give, uh, if I had the wherewithal, I love Polydectes so much that I would even give him the head of the Gorgon Medusa if that was what was called for. And Polydectes has got him right there. And he said, the head of Medusa is what I would want more than anything else. And so Perseus is now hooked. He has to go out and get the head of the Gorgon Medusa as a wedding present for Polydectes. And Polydectes knows this is an impossible task and he's got him right where he wants him and he figures when Perseus is off the scene he's going to have Danny for himself. And we'll leave off there and the next time we'll start talking about <laughs> You see all of this comes from I like doing things in serial fashion because we'll have to talk about a well instead of a tower. When I was a kid, uh, I lived in a uh, we lived in a little uh, township of Rhine, and everybody in the town Rhine uh, spoke German. In fact, there was a uh, church, a rural church, that uh, and they didn't have a cross on the top of it, but they had a rooster on the top of it. And they had two services. They had one service in English and one service in German. This was this still went on into the 50s yet, that they had German services in the church. But there was a crossroad. Beside it, at one crossroads was a church, and another crossroads was the town hall, and the other ta- uh, crossroads was where the bar was. <laughs> and bar and the dance hall, where everybody danced polkas. And in the summertime, uh, behind the dance hall outside they hung up a great big sheet and they had free movies and the in the free movies the the series that I last remember watching was the Durango kid who was the good guy and the bad guys had thrown the Durango kid into a well and it rained the next week and we never got to go back again and for all the rest of my life growing up, I've never known what happened to the Durango kid, so I'm hooked on cereals. <laughs> so next time we'll try to be much more, next time we'll deal totally with the hero and the work of the hero. Clearly the work is set before us. Any time that we're going to grow spiritually, we're given an impossible task. It's sort of like the task of no man, no mortal hath ever seen Isis. And so the people who have uh, have taken the veil away from Isis. And so we have to put ourselves in the position of those who succeed. And we have to not be human. 
we have to be divine and take away the veil of ISIS. And so that impossible task, psychologically, uh, I think the Jungians are right when they say you're given an impossible task because you have to change. You can't go any further the direction you're going in. Well, I didn't get much chance.